So welcome everybody to TWR Facebook Live. And I am very happy to be here this morning. Sorry, it was a few minutes late. Um, so, so welcome everybody to TWR Facebook Live. And I am very happy to be here this morning. Um, so, so welcome everybody to TWR Facebook Live, and I am very happy to be here. <laughs> we have some problems here. So, so welcome everybody to TWR Facebook Live. We're, we're calling a loop. <laughs> Uh, we have some problem here. Uh, okay, so I think uh, I think it seems like we are we are live, but uh, it's not that we are not seeing the. <laughs> okay, so so basically, um, <coughs> once again, uh, welcome everybody to TWR Facebook Live. I'm very, very happy here this morning. Um, we have a very special guest, uh, uh, Thomas Hazel and Jared Zizel and Dylan, who is supposed to be here. He's having some technological uh, problem. So uh, he hopefully he will join soon. And so I wanted to first uh, just say a few words, and I hope that all of you are having wonderful um, week since we started last Tuesday. I uh, hope wonderful uh, week of practices and having some uh, deep experiences with a, a dream. Um, I think uh, it's, it seems very clearly in a very simple way that how much attention that you put into the practice, commitment that you put into the practice, and uh, awareness that you put into the practice, all the awareness throughout the day, the stronger it is, the more chances it is to have experiences, that's for sure. And sometimes these practices can be very simple, very mundane kind of awareness. Sometimes they could be more, more very deep personal or spiritual kind of awareness, but to have that intention to connect day to the night with stronger is a better. So I remember um, two weeks ago that somehow I, I thought I, I'm going to do the maximum kind of awareness and effort, and not effort like painful effort, but awareness into the practice. And then in, in a row for two nights, uh, it was an amazing experience. But for two nights, uh, one one night I have at least like three three times. At the other night also at least twice lucid. And then I said, okay, well, I'll leave it alone a little bit, take it easier and not put too much uh, awareness or attention into it. Then I kind of be begin to lose back. So, so I think uh, this is what we're going to be talking here. I think, I think um, Thomas and Jared and Dylan, I'm sure they have a lot to say, say about it. So, so today what we're going to do is first, I would like to uh, give like a five minute to each one of them to share, ask, I'm asking them to share their uh, quintessential, the essential, essential, the experiences, what they have learned, they have experiences. And so that you can, we can, you can share with all of our, what we call cyber Sangha. So all around the world. So we are all around the world. We are, these, these uh, teachings are translated into 17 different languages around the world. So, so, uh, so, so welcome all three of you. So I will first, maybe Thomas, maybe you, you, you want to go ahead and say just a few words about yourself and then we were looking forward to your hear, hear you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks for this opportunity. It's a, it's a, it's such an honor talking to this. I can't believe it's in 17 languages. Yes. <laughs> um, so if I could just, I guess I'm going to briefly describe uh, my quint condense my quintessential practices here, which is a, a feat in itself. But just to give a little background in myself, I, um, 
uh, I was thinking about what to say. And I, for me, I never grew up with any um, religion or any spirituality. Um, and I'm a very skeptical person. So for me, it's always about direct experience. Um, and for me, dreaming changed all of that. Dreaming, especially lucid dreaming, um, really showed me that we're, we're so much more than just physical beings. Um, that reality exists way much more subtle and higher states than just the physical. Uh, and it showed direct from direct experience, which I think is really important. And I loved it because, A, there was no dogma attached to it. It wasn't everyone dreams, every single person. It's the most universal human experience we have. Um, um, but, uh, sorry, um, the, the fact that there's no dogma attached to it, that, that felt good for me. Um, sorry, sorry. <clears throat> I lost my train of thought there. But also, if I could just speak frankly, for me, it's also the coziest. To get a little bit attached to dogma, so then you will not get lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just joke. Uh, I got <laughs> attached there. Um, but for me, I always joke that it's, uh, it's the coziest spiritual practice because... Here you have the opportunity every single night to be in your pajamas, in bed, in a cozy, safe environment. And now you have access to go into uh, this inner landscape, this inner world um, that we all have access to. So it's like Tenzin Rinpoche, like you were saying, it should be effortless because we, we call it falling asleep. You know, we have this like relaxing, this falling, this letting go. Um, so it should be easy. It should be fun. It should have that like juicy, like um, ambition of excitement of I'm curious, a lot of curiosity. So I remember when I was first starting out, um, I had a bunch of lucid, uh, two lucid dreams when I was very young. And I tried to tell my mom, um, I tried to describe them to her. And I didn't really have the language to say these were, I was awake in them. Like they weren't, they weren't normal dreams. I knew they were something else. And I remember it just being sort of written off as if like I have a good imagination. But here I was, I remember distinctly, I was flying uh, miles above the earth with some geese. And it, I still remember it clearly as day uh, right now. Um, but I didn't really have the language to describe it. So it wasn't until as a teenager that I um, looked into it more, they started happening spontaneously. And um, for me, my intent was so great. I wanted to have a lucid dream and to know, to master this so much. It was sort of this burning desire, which I think is what you were sort of touching upon, that, that juicy electricity. Um, intent is really it. So for someone looking, uh, starting out, I always tell them, um, there's Dylan. I always tell them, A, um, to, know, to know your dreams, you have to just start looking for them. It's just the, uh, the act of looking itself is so important that we often are just like, why don't I dream? Well, we're dreaming every single night. Um, but are you looking for them? Are you going to bed with that burning intent to know your dreams, to wake up within them? Because that alone, really, the, no other technique. I, I sort of, as I went, uh, the techniques got a little bit more advanced. But in the beginning, it was just raw intent. I wanted to know my dreams. I wanted to become lucid in them. And that's often enough. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, so welcome, Dylan. Hello. <laughs> finally, you uh, made it. <laughs> I finally made it. Oh, wonderful. Thanks for well, having me. Sorry about that. That's OK. So uh, Jared, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so my lucid dreaming began in, um, I guess, when I was like a teenager in high school. My cousin. Uh, him and I, we would play lots of video games together, and he told me about it, and he's like, oh, you got to try this lucid dreaming thing. Um, it's like being in, you know, being in a video game world, and so you know, I was looking up all these different methods that, you know, I, I never naturally lucid dreamed. I, I was very aware of my dreams and thought about them a lot, but never just clicked into that lucidity that some do, and so, you know, I tried method after method. Um, and eventually, I started lucid dreaming more and more. My, my cousin actually kind of veered away from it, but I dove uh, deeper. And like, you know, a, a teenager, my uh, 
first lucid dreams are full of just fantasy fulfillment and going on adventures and fighting like giant monsters. Um, but eventually, you know, as I kind of got older and went through college and then actually started, you know, talking with uh, Thomas and Dylan more about dreams, I started actually looking more, you know, at myself and, you know, the, you know, the inner workings of my uh, psyche. Um, and, you know, one of the things that, you know, really, I guess, kind of like, I feel like brought me to a different level of uh, understanding of like the power of lucid dreams was when I had a conversation with myself, but it wasn't just like a duplicate of myself. It was actually the, I call it like dark Jared, which I, you know, I chalk up to being sort of the embodiment of the negative emotions inside of me, whether that's from fear or anger or just general, you know, something I'm upset about. And, you know, these feelings that, you know, I feel in both my, my waking life and my dream life. And, you know, in the dream, dream world, they often manifest as monsters or night or, you know, basically turn the dreams into nightmares. But the way I found to deal with them the best is essentially ask for dark Jared to appear. And sometimes like, you know, it's very terrifying to see myself um, sort of in an embodiment of the, of myself with these negative attributes. Um, because not only is it, are we separated, but we are also linked like everything in the dream world is. And so if I'm talking with dark Jared and he's getting upset or, you know, he will, and, you know, I can feel that energy from him trying to flow back into me, you know, and sometimes I'm, you know, successful. We kind of, hashed it out and I overcome a problem, but sometimes I'm unsuccessful and whatever was bothering me that, you know, the previous day comes into the next day, but, you know, it turns into a form of, uh, you know, self-work, I guess uh, I could call it. Um, and in, in dealing with, you know, that, um, but, you know, and so sort of getting into kind of like a, you know, a quint quintessential uh, tip, um, I, I definitely echo Tom's or Thomas's uh, advice to just you know know that you can dream and, and look for the dreams and, and be excited. Um, and one practical thing, and it's it's sort of cliched in the lucid dreaming world, but keep that dream journal because I've noticed with myself, and I've had like tons and tons of lucid dreams that as soon as I stop keeping the least the, the dream journal, my lucid dreams start to descend. They become a little bit cloudier. They don't. They, you know, don't show up. And, and also to echo uh, Tenzin's sort of opening words is like, there is amount of effort that goes into it. And, you know, without that effort, you know, things become a little hazier, that they're not as clear, you don't, you don't get the understanding that is, uh, that is possible. So you're saying that uh, the keeping journal kind of not didn't help, it, it kind of made it worse? Is that oh, no, no, I mean, uh, keeping the journal was was great. Definitely keep the journal. When I don't keep the journal, it gets it gets worse. Oh, so, okay. and then the journal is, I think, part of that that effort and that practice yeah, exactly. for awareness. It's part of the engagement, the commitment. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Dylan, so we are asking each one of you to share, like your really like a personal um, interest and a little story and. And mainly that, what is what is the technique or the exercises or your approach that really helped you to to have and enhance your uh, lucid dreaming practice? So can you just maybe just say a few words of yourself and please uh, share with us? Sure. Um, sorry again about my my late attendance. Um, hopefully I. I could stay here. I'm using my phone now, so you, the you're, gonna, you're gonna have a dream tonight about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. All my uh, my karmic traces are are developing. Um, but yeah, I'd love to to share a little bit. Um, so I I have known these two guys uh, since college. We met in college at at film school, um, and they're really the ones who uh, who uh, brought me into lucid dreaming and, and were teaching me. We all lived in the same apartment um, uh, together, so 
So both Thomas and Jared would wake up and they'd share their lucid dreams from the night before with me. And uh, I just, I, was, I started getting so excited. Uh, Thomas would, would, would come into the living room and he'd have this expression on his face. He had just been battling ogres and, and flying around. And so he, just, he would just tell me every detail about it and I would just soak it in, soak it in. Uh, because I've always been a very, uh, I guess, imaginative person. I've always been half in the dream world. Um, I know my parents have always said that I'm kind of a dreamy person. So, uh, and, and my life, uh, which still is true, is a, it's a creative life. And I'm trying to be a creative person. So I think that's why it appealed to me so strongly that you could actually go into a place where you are living through that creative experience and uh, literally creating your reality in front of your eyes. It's sort of um, a creative person's dream. So anyway, they were they were teaching me. Um, you know, I wanted to, to have lucid dreams, so they started teaching me, and they were giving me all the books they had on it. And uh, and really, the my lucid dreaming and, and the and the book project that came soon after was just uh, really a, an outgrowth of our friendship and from this exciting time, which I think is kind of a, a beautiful thing that it, it happened organically. It happened from from joy and just wanting to be part of that experience. Um, and so I, I started having my first list of dreams. Um, and, uh, but so then when we started writing the book, I was sort of the novice of the group that these Thomas and Jared had been doing it. You guys have been doing it for, for years. And I was, but I think that was important that I was uh, the novice. I think it, it helped our conversations about it, about how, because um, we started to, to wonder how to explain this to our generation, to Western people who are of our age, and the way to do it, I think, was uh, was to make it simple, make it fun, make it inspiring. So uh, hopefully I, I uh, brought that to the table where since they had been doing it for longer, I was able to kind of stop them sometimes and say, okay, I don't really know what you're talking about. I haven't had the exact experiences you're talking about. So if I don't understand it, uh, other people won't. So I became sort of that filter um, and then just, uh, hopefully using, I use my, you know, I think we're all, three of us are creative people. And, um, and the project became a way to use our creativity and our storytelling abilities to try to communicate this idea. Um, and one thing I was, when I was going through your book, Tenzin, um, that really spoke out to me, which I think is similar to what I was experiencing, is, is it really is about direct experience. It's, it's, you can get lost in the academics of it, and you could get uh, just um, so engrossed in the processes and the techniques and the step-by-step -step and all that has a place. But, um, but I think we we're coming from the point of view, whereas if people are not inspired then they're, they're not necessarily going to have lucid dreams. And I think we were pleasantly surprised when we realized that that was sort of a secret ingredient that uh, when we were tell telling our friends and sort of, uh, working on these techniques, if we could make someone really excited and inspired and, and just sort of um, as excited as I was when they were telling me in their apartment, um, then we could sort of, lucid dreams were happening, people were having their first lucid dreams from just having a conversation with us and getting excited about it. Um, so I, I think that's been, it. and since, uh, you know, I, I don't think I've moved too far past my novice level in terms of my lucid dreams, but I've had a, you know, a good handful of lucid dreams and they really have, uh, you know, and, and we've talked to people, even having just a few lucid dreams, it changes you and you wake up and you just feel this glow, this afterglow, and that stays with you for the rest of your life. Because you've experienced a different side of reality. Um, Wonderful. That's me in a nutshell. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, all three of you. Wonderful to uh, uh, hear you. And I think it's a nice story that you, all of you know each other from college and being very good friends and especially able to, you know, inspire each other, share your dreams with each other. As a out, you you came out a book. So everybody, the, the book is called of. A field guide to lucid dreaming. So I'm sure it's in Amazon, and uh, so uh, so if anybody who's interested to their work, that I'm sure there's information also there. So so maybe I'll just try to kind of a little bit summarize a little bit. Um, to as uh, Thomas was saying, I think uh, it's, 
in a very in a very very simple way that uh, it is very true that uh, the intention the deep i mean it's not just intention it's not like okay i'm interested in a dream kind of very very lightly i'm interested in dream yeah that sounds interesting i would i would love to practice and and not like that but i really like to practice i would like to do it today right now for tonight and i want to do you know have this everything everything this very moment for example if you all of you who are listening to this very moment um the talk here just think about this even event that you are in fact you are listening through your your computer uh, through your ipad and phone it's kind of very strange to able to see these people on your iphone and ipad uh, somebody is speaking from around the world this is really strange enough to just look at this exactly itself as a dream how it cannot be a dream this is a dream this is a dream and um, so if i i hope these these experiences this interaction this learning will continue for the rest of the afternoon and evening in some places in europe is already bad time so as you even going to sleep you think about okay you're going to have this conversation continuously in your dream may i wake up in my dream may i re continuously um how you say have a lucid dream and able to interact in my lucid dream with these people like that so some sense of very very strong sense of uh, intention i think seems very important so like three of you are having um you know sharing each other and i think wonderful thing is now uh, in this this particular case we are here what we call cyber sangha so so people are from all around the world and uh, one thing last time i i requested everybody is that a commitment it's not a commitment toward me or to, a commitment toward a specific tradition dogma nothing like that for next two months until august 8 that i am truly committed to doing these exercises committed to um connecting my awakening awareness to the awareness of the night uh connected to ha- wanting to have a lucid dream uh, dreams praying to have a lucid dream and able to uh, transform and transcend and uh, do things in my lucid dream the strong sense of intention this is what i've been asking everybody maybe everybody who is listening you can say i'm happy to please give your feedback uh, now if, um how is how it's going on i think it's a nice thing one thing nice thing about facebook live is yeah people are able to everybody uh, in one given moment they are able to give feedback and they're not interfering not in, disturbing anybody so please go ahead and uh, i want to hear have you been committed have you been really seriously um, engaged with these practices and uh, doing the practices have you have some experiences and please go ahead and let me know so i think uh, very much looking forward to hear that and also i just those who are listening this week first time again i uh, remind everybody it's as thomas and all of them just mentioned that uh that the strong sense of this excitement enthusiasm drive intention is the key to have a lucid dream to key to have able to bridge between the awareness of the day to the awareness of the night the consciousness of the day to the consciousness of the ni- in the night uh, because the the day uh, when we talk about the awareness of the day is basically we are talking a few things we are talking about uh, our activities of the body our uh, communication of our speech our mental imagination our our thoughts and emotions and our feelings of our mind these are the maybe what we what we call three doors so body speech and mind these are actually the only three things that we engage the world during the daytime and these are the only three things that should engage or make the bridge toward the night so bringing that a conscious into unconscious uh, bringing that awareness into uh when you begin to most of the time when we begin to lose the awareness as we decline our senses and 
uh, kind of lose our kind of energy and we are exhausted, we are tired, we wanted to just, you know, it's like uh, going to the bed, just the attitude of going to the bed, look at that. You know, you, some people are like, after a long day in the evening, you're half dead. And then when you get home, you throw your bag, you throw your shoes, you you throw you half dead, you throw yourself on the bed, that's it, you're gone. So there is no sense of a preparation or going, going towards something, going towards something very sacred, very special journey, very enthusiastic about that. It, nobody does that. They just they drop themselves. It, that's it. So that that attitude is the most, the biggest obstacle to have any experiences in a dream or to have even a lucid dream. So so the attitude should be totally opposite. So. So I hope that uh, all of new people who are listening, that you are really um, uh, engaged and committed for until August 8th. So we are, and these three guys here, um, they are from the college, they are kind of being together and supporting each other. So think about the same way, uh, three, three turn into a few couple of thousand people. We are all, in our uh, connected to each other through the cyber we are connected we call that's what we call cyber sangha regardless of where you're living what what country you are from it does not matter at least until 17 languages we manage to pull things together we are trying to work hard to have more languages so no matter where you are where you're living we are all connected here we are all supporting each other and uh, just feel that and then your part is really trying to engage with that. So um, maybe um, each one of you maybe wanted to say something about what I'm saying here. And then maybe then I, later I will go back into sp speak four specific things from uh, very ancient texts. So I will kind of talk a little bit about it. So maybe I will I wanted to open to all three of you. Yeah, if I could jump in real quick. Um, uh, on top of intention, which again, for me in the beginning, it was just intention. I had no other practices. It was just, I want to become lucid. And that was my burning desire. I, I had a, a seed of it. I knew what it felt like, but it was this burning passion. Um, on top of that, um, something like, uh, I think it's really important when you're lucid, you know, di from direct experience, how, important your thoughts are, how they shape the world around you. And you, you see it directly. If you think there's going to be a scary thing around that corner of a building, you turn the corner of the building in the lucid dream and there's going to be some figure. It's the dream uh, shapes itself around your thoughts and your emotions and your expectations. So um, I think it's really important to have that intention, but also to have that strong, that strong will that, um, uh, to really separate, ho hopefully I make sense here, to hopefully separate your awareness from your thoughts. So typically throughout the day, we're just, we are our thoughts, right? We think, you know, we're just kind of identifying with our thoughts. But if we can pull back and know that there's some observer, that there's some uh, watcher or witnessing presence behind the thoughts, and we anchor to that thing back there, that's really what we want. Uh, that's really what gets lucid. So, during the day, um, creating distance between thoughts. I think that's really important um, because w in the lucid dream, you might be, you know, say doing like a reality check in the waking state, you might pause and create distance from your life and say, am I dreaming right now? And you feel like an idiot. You do like a reality check, you put your finger through your hand or you breathe through your nose and it feels kind of dumb, but you're trying to create that distance to create um, a sense of, extreme presence. But when you go into a dream and that habit goes in, that habit happens and you say, am I dreaming? And you're like, of course I'm not. And your finger goes through or your finger elongates or you can breathe through your nose. It's a beautiful, inspiring experience to finally look around and say, I'm completely awake inside of a dream right now. It's a very beautiful uh, experience. So I think in intention plus that, that, um, that focus, that single pointed focus or that, um, that awareness, that strengthening that awareness behind the thoughts is important. Awareness behind your thought, awareness behind your emotions, 
that is key for lucid part of the lucid dream practice and lucid dream absolutely and we will definitely i will touch that about that a little, little bit later from this traditional text so uh, any other yeah one of uh, one thing i i love just in general is metaphors you know in you know literature in movies and tv it's this poetic way of understanding something either in a new light or to a deeper understanding or with clarity. So when it comes to, you know, lucid dreaming, I often apply a certain, you know, a metaphor of sorts to the various practices that I do. Um, even in our book, we have this sort of underlying metaphor um, about this journey into a jungle or a trip to, you know, uh, we call it a field guide to lucid dreaming because we were thinking like oh this could be a guidebook to this other place to the dream world um and one of my favorite practices and it's just something very small is um you, you mentioned like so attending so many people just plop onto their bed and pass out um i like to look at the bed as this sort of you know the spaceship or like interdimensional you know spaceship and so when I get in and I like wrap the blankets around, it's like I'm strapping in and I'll even like in my mind visualize like, all right, I'm going into this, you know, this vessel that's going to take me to somewhere else. And I'll even pretend like, all right, I got to flip the controls on and it starts to do something to my mind. And it gets, I get into this, you know, this idea that, all right, I'm really going somewhere. And, and we are, our consciousness is going somewhere, but sometimes just saying like, oh, your consciousness is going to go you know, to the dream world, it's, it's not as tangible. Um, and I think some people can, might bump up against that and have difficulty. Um, so to kind of do a bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of imagination. You're, you're getting into the spaceship and as you go to sleep, that's, you're drifting off into sleep and that's essentially the spaceship blasting off and you're, you're traveling. And then when you get there, you arrive in the dream world and you know, you're, you're free to explore. Wonderful, wonderful. I love that. Metaphor. Yeah, so um, I just maybe before Dinan says something, I will just say, add something here. It's in the Tibetan tradition, we say Nangwa, Lung, and Sen, which means vision, uh, prana, or the wind, and consciousness. So three things. It's like a, basically, it's like a, either it's like a, um, airplane that you're taking off or, or the spaceship that you're taking <laughs> off whatever that the what what is the engine dri driving engine or the driving force is these three things and uh, nangwa which basically means a vision that means that very moment the images that you have you know uh, will be like what you are saying images of the spaceship or image images of journeying journeying into the sacred dimension the other world and that, that, that sense of whatever the images are, very important to, to observe that, Nangwa. Um, and then the, the, is the so Sem, Nangwa Sem, Nangwa, uh, I said, what is it? Lung, the prana, um, is also uh, very important. The wind, basically, we say uh, Lung Sem, uh, the wind and the consciousness, two main things which drives the intention. So the energy is, for example, if you draw your attention to the heart, whatever you're feeling in the heart, that energy becomes a very important part of the dream, what you're going to dream. If there's a pain there that unless you're able to change and transform and transcend something, it's going to affect your, your dream because that will become, because that, that, that consciousness, that pain, image of pain and uh, there's a wind related to it, so that that wind is actually going to cause it. Unless you can clear that wind, so so then you are changing the position of the direction uh, direction of the journey. So now one lung sem. So these three things, and then of course I will add the position also the body because sometimes which position you sit sit. Even even the last images that you see, if you before you close eye, what was the last image that you saw, or in the wall or in in your mind? Those are important images. But you need to know you are actually aware what images you came to you, what thoughts you came to you in relation to that image. Would you 
uh, are you able to be aware and change or did it drive you and it drag you? You know, it's all those, these last moment events are very, very important uh, point of the yeah, lucid dreaming. So I think at the spaceship, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I like all these metaphors. They're great metaphors. Um, yeah, it's so comforting uh, reading your book. To, it's always comforting to see that these ideas that we are experiencing naturally when we were trying to lucid dream have been written about and talked about for thousands of years in your tradition. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. Uh, the only thing I was going to add is I was, uh, I was working on a farm a few years ago. I was just helping out for a few weeks and I, there was a, uh, the son of the farmer was about 13 years old. And I think he played video games and he was typical 13 year old, but very, uh, confident, maybe overconfident. Um, but I, uh, was telling him about lucid dreaming one day and, you know, just kind of giving him the basics. I wasn't trying to teach him. I wasn't giving, I didn't give him any techniques. I just, really quickly describe the main idea. Uh, and then the next morning I was talking to him and he's like, oh yeah, that, um, that lucid dreaming thing you mentioned, I did that last night. Uh, it was fun. I flew around the, the, the uh, property and did a few things. Anyway, what's for breakfast? Um, so I think there's something, I think we've come across this many times. We've talked to people um, who had spontaneous lucid dreams when they were kids. And that seems to, to be a really common thing. And I think there's something to that where we've also talked to people who've tried in their adult years, you know, for months or years to do it and they just can't break through that wall. And I think there's something uh, about unlearning uh, sometimes and trying to connect with that inner child and connect with that sense of joy and um, inspiration um, and making it into a game talking with friends about it and just just making it a joyous uh, childlike activity because that's event, you know, really what we're doing, we're going into a place of our own imagination. Uh, so what could be more childlike than that? Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, uh, all of you. Uh, it's a wonderful experience to share. So maybe I would like to, um, since, uh, we will have until next week, we will all our cyber sangha will be um, focusing on a practice. So I wanted to speak a little bit um, for different exercises. So sometimes I call for foundational exercises, which in my book, but I will just, just talk a little bit from the, the text, original ancient text called, this is the, again, I showed the, it's called Maji Sanji Jisum. Uh, from tantric tradition in the Bhutan tradition, and uh, so I have kind of narrowed down a few po four, four points. So the first point is called I will I will just I will say it in Tibetan because I know like some number of Tibetan people watch also. Sometimes they uh, they think about oh you're talking so much about all these things. What are you talking? Where are they or something like that? They having a hard time to referencing them in in the text. So I will. For that purpose, I'm going to mention the, the, the lines here. So first is called Paksha Jur, second is called Shempa Do, third is called Dimpa Tang, and the fourth is called Tempa So. So the first Paksha Jur basically mean what I call it changing karmic traces. So, so throughout what we do, uh, it affects our night. So basically every single moment throughout the day, uh, how you act with your body, how you speak with your speech, how you imagine and think and feel through your mind. It's constantly, you are producing your dream. So right this very moment, you are producing your dream for the tonight or not for, for the nights in the future. So, so that's, I think it's very important to understand. So if you are aware now, you're more likely to be aware. If you are confused now, you have more likely to have a confusing dream. If you are happy now, you are more likely to be having happy dreams. You know, if you feel confidence now, you are more likely to be able to change things in your dream. So it constantly, this very moment of conscious activity of body, speech, and mind is kind of um, affecting. So that's so because of that. So we are saying change your karmic karmic traces, 
Uh, if you if you don't like your nightmares, if you don't like your bad sleep quality, if you don't like uh, getting lost in your dream and not having control in your dream, you, if you don't like having this reoccurring dream about getting lost in your dream for the last 20, 30 years, then you you have ability to change that, but you're not going to change in your dream. Your ability to change that is the how you act, how you speak, how you think this very moment, even the way the moment you're listening to me, if you watch how you're listening to me, maybe there's something in the way you're listening to me, like, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe a lot of openness, a lot of sense of enthusiasm, a lot of sense of joy, a lot of sense of playfulness, a lot, a lot of sense of curiosity, a bit of wanting to learn. Or you can say, oh my God, you know, these guys are just kind of, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't believe in anything of these things. And I don't think it's possible. I don't think uh, you can change anything. I don't think if you even change something, what's going to benefit about it? You know, just basically, just anywhere from the closeness to doubt, to suspicious, to negative rejections, to a constantly, basically, a wrong relationship. Uh, we could be totally wrong, but you could have a good relation to us, right? Don't you agree, all of you? <laughs> so, but basically, it's like completely, uh, you can have that, but at some point, if, if you are experiencing like that, then you, somebody needs to, to be aware of that. And the only person should be aware of that is you, because other person, maybe your wife is aware of that, that, that doesn't help you. Your, your husband is aware of that, that doesn't help you. Your, your boss is aware of that, that doesn't help you. So you need to be aware of that. Same way that the moment you are aware of that your attitude toward the world toward the life is you're producing your dream every day and you know so that's called changing karmic trees so moment you are aware awareness this is what you are saying uh, thomas was saying is that it's not what i'm thinking for example i'm angry i'm angry i'm angry right now i'm agitated but i'm not conscious and somebody tells you you're angry and I'm saying, I'm not angry. What do you mean? You know, I can respond like that. So maybe it's a truly, I'm not, I'm not conscious that I'm angry. That's why I'm saying I'm not angry, even though I am angry. So there's awareness be, behind those emotions that somebody says, oh, I'm agitated. That awareness counts. That awareness can change your karmic traces. Or I might end up saying something very bad here. Or I have option to change my speech. Or I feel a little bit more space as I'm being aware of it. I have opportunity to connect with these people. I have opportunity to say something positive, say something nice. It doesn't matter what the topic is. I have opportunity to connect with people. It's a joy to connect with somebody. That's what really counts. It's not topic. It's not what, but the connection counts. So you can open up yourself more and more towards somebody to connecting and feeling more and more space and more and more joy. You are already transforming this moment. You are changing your karmic traces already during the waking state as you are feeling these negative emotions. And that is going to impact your dream because you are changing karmic trees. Because normal pattern, pattern will be you are entering into the negative thought, emotion and actions and rejections and all the time. But this moment, you manage to change something. So training your mind throughout the day when that happens. So this is not exercise number one. So basically, uh, I am, as I said, this is about this driving, driving fire. This is about commitment. This is about really like having enthusiasm for until, until at least August 8. So I want all of you at least uh, be very, 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 very conscious about your day. 
your interaction with people, with your body, with your speech and your mind. You know, as I gave last time example, that if you're going to the same work for last 30, 40 years and you hate it, that's incredible amount of time to hate and continuously still engage. If you're being with somebody in relationship for last 10 years, 20 years, but you never really saw the person, you never really felt the person, you never, never really connected with that individual on a deeper level. And maybe you're always trying to resist, improve, uh, per, how you say, protect yourself, defend yourself, always prove yourself, always you're right. If that's your behavior in your relationship with somebody, you're not having fun in that relationship for sure. Maybe you are, when you are doing that, you are producing those kind of negative feelings in your dream. So, so your opportunity to change your karmic trace, this is what I'm saying. So I wanted to give this, this a minimum, uh, a number of exercises. I want everybody to remember at least five times. This is the, the minimum number, remembering your actions of body, speech, and mind um, five times when you're engaged negatively when you're only doing but not being aware of the stillness, when you're only talking but not awareness of who is talking, when you're only feeling or acting through your feelings and emotion, when you don't know who is actually feeling and who is aware of it. The behind what Thomas was saying, the behind those thoughts, actions, then it's not fun. So then you are not able to change and transform and transcend and grow and develop anything. So I'm asking all of you is just at least five times, very strong intention, trying to work every day. So that's the exercise number one. Exercise number two, or oh, so let's see, I will let me read it from here. It says, uh, um, Nusanji B. Julie, so this is the text I was referring earlier. It doesn't matter which text is coming from. Don't think about it coming from certain Tibetan texts or, and then you have to follow that. It's not about that. If what you are trying to, reason why I'm trying to mention these texts and reason why, for me, it's always, um, uh, how you say, uh, I think a little bit what Thomas was saying er earlier, is there's no dogma. For me, in some sense, being attached to some original or tradition, unbroken lineage is more, for me, is more valuable. So I feel like, a, okay, may, I'm not just creating with my mind these ideas and these theories, these dreams, and going fantasizing everything, but there are thousands of teachers and masters. They went through the same, they practiced, they left something for us. There's something. So whenever I'm able to trace something back, it's it like a, it like a, um, how you say, um, verifying in some sense of saying, okay, I think uh, unless they were in the wrong too. <laughs> so it's a verifying some sense of these people, enlightened people, masters have experiences. You're having the same thing. So you're on the right track. So that's why sometimes I prefer to refer to these lines. So so that's why I'm saying. So it says, uh, so during the daytime, all, all the experience that you are having, illusory experiences, like a dream-like experiences you are having. Uh, um, yeah, so all this is you, you trying to think them as a dream. So every experience that you are having, look at them as a dream. That's the exercise number one. So you wake up in the morning, you say, oh, this is a dream. I'm continuously dreaming. Uh, my dream cup of tea, my dream of cup of coffee, my dream car, my dream traffic, my dream boss, my dream unfinished project, my dream problem. And so you think the boss will be much fun if you look at a boss as a dream. <laughs> and uh, your, all your problem, you look them as a dream, I think you feel much more less affected by your problems. So the idea of seeing everything as a dream is where you change your karmic trees. I, I know it's not just saying things they are like a dream, but going beyond, beyond that thought, 
action and into that awareness and realizing things as a dream. That's obviously more key. So, so that's the first exercise. And second exercise is called Shemba Dog. Shemba Dog means uh, preventing the attachment or uh, changing your attachment in some sense means, uh, so throughout all the experience that you have, it's all the experiences through your body, all the experiences through your speech, all the experiences through your mind. Not all of these three experiences are equal, which means there are many things that you do we don't remember. Maybe they're not so, they don't impact us so much. For example, they say we have 84,000 thoughts a day, but not all of them, all these thoughts impact us. Maybe there's only three thoughts like yesterday that you have that really impacted you, impacted you felt excited or you felt pain, you felt confused or you felt hopeful. Uh, so there are few thoughts and events that really touch you personally, uh, either in a good way or maybe painful way. So those events, it happens because you are attached to them. You're attached to your identity, you're attached to some specific outcome, and because of your identity, identity ego is not fulfilled because your expectation came, uh, did not come uh, as you expected, you get hurt, you get pain. And when you feel that, that very moment, not only feel the pain, but be aware of pain, loosen the pain, find the awareness and able to transform and change pain and see them as a dream. So that's this kind of second exercise. So I want all of you to this second exercise also at least five times. So five times, five times, right? So the numbers are adding up a little bit now. <laughs> um, but again, you know, how many times you worry? No, I, no if for somebody to tell you worry only, you should worry only five times, you, you're in big trouble, right? <laughs> so you would worry so many times. So, but the opposite side, whenever you worry, you just be aware that you're worried. That, that, that's good enough exercise here. Yeah. I'm worried. I just realized I'm worrying. I just realized I'm worrying about things that I really don't need to worry. That's enough. That's good enough than just worrying and without being aware of your worrying. So, so to keep on doing that. So that second exercise. The third exercise, okay, second exercise. So in the text it says, uh, so when you are interacting with your behavior and conduct, uh, which is we call cholam, uh, so all the, um, particularly effort, you know, you see everything what we do is we don't necessarily put the same amount of effort. You know, you are resting, you don't put too effort to rest. But if you're sitting upward and maybe you say, sit in a five meditation position, then you say, oh, what is the five meditation position? You get immediately effortful mood. And then you're trying to sit there and it's supposed to be a very relaxing position, but you begin to hurt. Your back hurting, your shoulder hurting, your everybody hurting. Why? Because you are putting effort. So anywhere in life, anywhere in any behavior, uh, you are, when you are putting efforts, just be conscious. Don't put effort anywhere. But there's a difference between the effort and what we're talking about intention. I think uh, that's very big different. Effort is where you're struggling. Effort is where you're struggling. But intention, you can be very enthusiastic. You can be very joyful, very excited, like a, a teenage first time going to the Disneyland. There is no effort. Excited. So I want you to be teenage, first time going to Disneyland. You are going into the Disneyland of the dream world. That is the, the best Disneyland you can ever think. If you miss the Disneyland, now you're getting older, this is your opportunity to visit the Disneyland, right? So do that. Um, so the third one, is, is called dumpatang. Dumpatang means basically means um, um, having intention. 
sending intention or having intention. So the third exercise you don't do during the daytime, but you do uh, before you go to sleep. So just before you go to sleep, maybe take like a 10 minute or five minute. And you, it can be also just in a lying, lying position, comfortable position, position you prefer. You just reflect the day, just don't drop in like half dead and dying there, but think about just what happened during the daytime. Oh, a lot of work, a lot of stress, a lot of tension, a lot of defending, a lot of trying to prove something. Or, oh, it was so great day, very open, a lot of freedom, a lot of joy, a lot of playfulness, a lot of fun, a lot of laughter, a lot of humor. You know, whatever it is, if it's a good, you don't have to worry about it, then it's fine. But if it's something bad, you don't want to carry those thoughts, those emotions, those feelings into the night. Remember, we were talking about sending positive, inspiring curiosity and uh, intention to the night, making, making the bridge. But if, usually you don't make the positive bridge, but you are so master in making a negative bridge into the night. You're constantly, you're doing that. Nobody's guiding you any practice. Nobody's doing a Facebook Live or teaching you or writing a book about it. You are master in making those bridges of your pain, confusion, suffering, and taking into the, into the night and having nightmares and bad sleeps and an exhausted morning and, you know, every night. What you're trying to do is trying to break that pattern. We do it all the time, trying to break that pattern and resent the positive intention could be just a very short moment. So, so that's important for exercise for exercise three. So just before you go to sleep and um, whatever the karmic traces, whatever the recollection, memory, thoughts and emotions and feelings and experiences arising, and you think, oh, that person was really horrible. That person was so beautiful, beautiful, very attractive. You get, you're attached to somebody. You are rejected to somebody. You hate somebody. You're too attached to somebody. Look at those emotions out of attachment or anger. And look at, go beyond that. Find that awareness. Transform that, this negative emotion. Find a new space for new journey into your dream and prayer, saying, may I have a clear dream? May I have a restful dream? May I have a lucid dream? May I be able to transform my lucid dream? May I develop myself? May I ever find myself? Send these uh, positive intentions in your uh, sleep before you, go to, uh, before you go to sleep. So that's the number three, sending intention is called. <clears throat> and the last one is... Uh, it's about when you wake up in the morning. Once you go to sleep, you go to sleep, you know, then you don't do particularly anything. You just kind of wait what happens in the night. And in the morning you wake up, you look at yourself, what happened? What happened? Did I sleep well? Sleep better? Did I have a lucid dream? Did I able to uh, transform something in my dream? Did I have some freedom choices in my dream? Uh, and just look at that. <clears throat> be happy about if there was a success, but if there was a no success, don't be discouraged. Resend the intention. Pray I did not have, but I'm going to have tonight. So sending that intention, I think that's kind of very important. It says uh, in the text, So So when you wake up, Either you have a lucid or you don't have a lucid, but the, you resend, reinforce your intention again during the waking. When you wake up in the first thing in the morning, it's important to do that. So these are the four exercises. So then maybe uh, I will uh, let um, um, three of you, maybe if you wanted to say some few words, uh, please welcome. Yeah, I just wanted to touch upon uh, the points just because <laughs> They, they're beautiful and they also, they sort of interpenetrate each other. 
like for me, when you were describing one and two, sort of being aware of your thoughts and your emotions, um, that again, it was sort of like creating the distance between you're not, say you're feeling angry now with awareness. Oh, I'm angry now, always with awareness, whether you're lucid or I guess lucid in your waking life with awareness comes choice. I can either choose to empower this uh, emotion or I can choose to uh, let it go. So with choice always comes freedom. So you're by creating that distance, you're really allowing yourself to be more lucid in your daily life. Uh, and that's just going to trickle over into your dreams because that's really the awareness we want to uh, strengthen. We want to anchor to that awareness behind the thoughts, behind the emotions. So I thought one and two were really good. Um, and if I could just touch upon three and four just before uh, I, I know we're, we're running out of time. But um, with three, I think it, you said no effort, like before sleep, making that intention, um, making it a sacred space. Uh, I've heard you mention how important it is to purify your thoughts and um, maybe take a bath, do some breathing exercises, really letting uh, the, the day go. Because when, we're, when we can't sleep or we're feeling insomnia, it's often because we can't let go of the day. We can't let go of certain thoughts. We can't let go of certain things we felt. So again, you're in that practice. Again, you're the observer. You're sort of back there as the observer, letting, you know, observing the thoughts, but maybe not empowering them, just letting them go like clouds. And if you want, I mean, if you remain as that observer, as your body falls, to, falls asleep, you'll enter into sleep paralysis, and then you can actually exit into a lucid dream directly. So, so it's really the, sorry, go on. Yeah. So, so basically, I think uh, there's a uh, two kind of main uh, key point there. Uh, you're trying to if it's, I mean, it's not a question about one, what one should do. It's more a question about one, what one is able to do. So uh, if it's possible to remain in that observer, I think it has to go, go to sleep, that, that's fine. But the most of the time, it's, that aspect is a little bit more difficult for people because uh, then that space is not used, it's the stability and groundedness and that awareness is not strong then the thought comes back and interferes. So what you're trying to do in a dream practice, not in the sleep practice, but in dream practice, you're trying to bring certain quality of positive. Like in, if, if the emotions are anger, then you're trying to bring, bring so, some sense of more love. Love can be a little bit more grounding for people than and the awareness of the observer because love is a little bit more familiar. At least idea is more familiar. Experience is a little bit more familiar than the pure awareness. So I think uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very important point, what Thomas, what you're trying to say. I think we are running out of time. We are already running out of time. So, <laughs> so I wanted to just, just quickly conclude. So basically, I hope that all of you really, really, really engage with the practice. And we will definitely, uh, in, the, in the future sessions, we'll be coming back and uh, touching on these four areas again, what going more deep into one and also saying what are the differences is between um, uh, each other and why each of them are very, very important if, and why if, if one is not there, what, what will be, I mean, what is what we are lacking? I'm going to go into a little bit more into those things in, in the next sessions in the future. And uh, so, um, yeah, so basically, our activity or body, speech, and mind, um, spiritual activity, I mean, just be, uh, more like a, um, depends on what you mean by spiritual. I mean, sometimes you can go into deep integration to the practices and meditation, but other times just being decent, being reasonable, being uh, nicer, being kinder, being more considered. I think those behavior, I think, in ever, trying to bring in our everyday life is very important. Being helpful or being able to ask if you need help, trusting people that you can ask help too. So those experiences, I would like all of you trying to bring as much as uh, waking practices, waking awareness that will help you to bring more awareness in your dream. And uh, so, so that's all. So I wanted to thank you again. So their book is A Field Guide to Lucid Dreaming. So please check out. 
and uh, thank you, uh, Thomas, Jared, Dylan, all of you. Wonderful uh, spending time with you, all of you this morning. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tim. Yeah, thanks. Thank you.